Send us your seven gifts, especially the gift of understanding, so we may penetrate more and more in a deeper way your word. Without your help, it's only frustration and everything we do is in vain. Help us, teach us to pray. Teach us how to be in our Lord's presence. Give us a firm, resolute will so that not only do we see the good, but we can do it as well in our actions. We ask through the intercession of our Blessed Mother as well, her peace and her serenity, so that we don't give in to the agitations or the anxieties of the evil one. My thoughts are thoughts of peace. Our Lord speaks through Jeremiah saying that my thoughts are thoughts of peace and of tranquility. He doesn't cause disruptions or anxieties. We ask this also through all the intercession, to the intercession of all the saints, St. Patrick, St. Bridget, St. Colm Kill, St. Brendan, and through the intercession of St. Joseph. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So tonight, we are going to meditate on John 12. Verses 1 through 11. The anointing at Bethany. Whenever you see bet in a word in the Bible, um, just think of house. B-E-T is house in Hebrew. Bet, so it's the house of something. Bethlehem is the house of bread. Funny enough, he was born in a trough. Well, he wasn't born in the trough. He was laid in the trough, and the trough is usually for food, for animals. And Bethlehem, Bethlehem, the house of bread. And he would later say, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have no life in you. He's the bread that came down from heaven. And the Aramaic is even stronger, it's the house of flesh. So, Bet is house, Bethany would be the house of obedience. Bethany is, is his house of comfort and consolation. We read this gospel, if I'm not mistaken, every Holy Tuesday. I think it's Tuesday. I think Spy Wednesday is the betrayal. It could be Tuesday or Wednesday, but we read it in Holy Week every year. And it's right before our Lord goes into Jerusalem. And you're putting yourself into the mentality of our Lord and his followers. Jerusalem, which means city of peace, is going to be his end. Like, he, he's going to die. If you go there, you're going to die. Because they've been plotting to kill you. And was it Philip or Thomas who said, well, look, Lord, we'll go with you. We'll all die together. If we're going to Jerusalem, if that's if your mind's made up, and it was, in Mark it says he hardened his face. 
which is like an expression to say that he was, he just, he made up his mind and he's going. He hardened his face and he went to Jerusalem. He's going to die. So this pit stop where he stops before going to Jerusalem is in the house of obedience. Bethany. Uh, there's a lot to be said about that because he knows what's going to happen to him in Jerusalem. He knows. like he, he, There's a tension there, interior tension, that... I mean, he's going he's, he's gonna to meet his fate. He's the servant of Isaiah, the suffering servant, which tomorrow we'll get a bit more into the suffering servant because we're going to be getting more into the passion. But uh, his beard would be pulled. He'll be spat at. They're going to mock him. <laughs> strip him. Like, that's all there in Isaiah, and he's aware of that. He's aware that he's the servant. He knows what's going to happen in Jerusalem. So six days before the Passover, Jesus went to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom he had raised from the dead. You guys remember Lazarus, that Jesus wept. He must have had a very close relationship with Lazarus. It's an interesting, an interesting relationship, because we don't really get much more detail than the fact that they were very, very close and he was also very close to Mary because we know that there's something very, very special there with Mary. We don't know if this is the same Mary of Magdala or if it's the sinful woman caught in adultery, if it's the same, if they're all the same Mary. There are some church fathers that say it is the same. I always just imagined it was as well, that Mary of Magdalene was the same Mary. I think in Valtorta she's the same Mary. I don't know if you guys have read the poem of the man god, Maria Valtorta. I think Maria Valtorta says she is as well, that she was the Magdalene, Mary Magdalene was a prostitute, but like of upper class. So like more just kind of expensive. And she would have I mean she would have been making good money, and then the, the ointment that was bought would have been from that money. But look, whether it's the same or not, they're very close as well, Mary and our Lord. In the other Gospels, it's Mary who's at his feet. She's just there at his feet. And Martha's serving. Martha was very anxious because there's a lot to do. I mean, there's 12 disciples in the house. Like, like these guys were probably starving almost like the whole time because like Jesus said, you know, the Son of Man doesn't have a place to lay his head and we're probably not going to be getting a decent meal. That's, sorry. Um, so like, you know, there's an episode they're walking through a field and they're just eating heads of grain, you know, just goes to show these guys were probably pretty hungry. Um, and when Philip had a bit of, you know, he had a bit of a stash, a secret stash of bread and fish. And the Lord asked him to feed the multitude. And they're like, Lord, we don't have anything. Like, well, actually, Philip, he was, he, Philip, yeah, he's got the stash. And he did. Philip provided a bit of a stash there. And they were able to multiply it. But, I mean, you can imagine these guys in a, an actual, like, nice, proper house. They were probably pretty excited. They're probably like, oh. We're finally, like we can actually sit down. There's not like a mob, thousands of people on us, you know, just to ourselves, and we're gonna tuck in. So they were probably devouring everything that Martha was preparing, and she was probably freaking out and going back and forth looking for something else. And this whole time, Mary's just sitting there, she's just sitting down. And uh, Martha probably wanted to be sitting down. They knew who he was. They had very strong faith. Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Like you, like you heal people, you know, no one's ever spoken or done anything like you're doing. They knew who he was. And well, how come she gets to sit there? Like what's she doing there? You can, you can imagine if she's going back and forth from the kitchen to the, the dining room, these guys are, you know, like they're rough. I don't know if they were belching, like hopefully they weren't, but like, I don't know. Like you can imagine the scene. I don't know what was going on. Like hopefully they had a bit more manners. 
but they were kind of rough guys. And she's going back and forth feeding them, they're eating it. And then, you know, as she's going back in, she just kind of catches a glimpse that Mary's just there sitting down. And the Lord's probably having like really deep, unbelievable conversation with her, you know, about the spiritual life. <laughs> He's probably revealing things to her. And uh, Martha, she kind of snaps a bit and she says, Look, Lord, I mean, like, is it, you know, like, do you not see what's going on? Like, can she not maybe get up and maybe clear the plates at least? Uh, like, do something? And he says, uh, Martha, Martha, there's a lot going on right now in your head. You're letting yourself be moved by a lot of anxiety. Mary has chosen the better part. So he's, he's obviously talking about, I mean, it's, it's a good thing that she's serving. We're supposed to be serving, but like we're not supposed to lose it to the point where we're just, you know, even whatever you're doing, you've just lost your peace. You lost your peace. So that's not a good thing ever. You're always supposed to keep your peace. So he loved Lazarus, he loved Mary, he loved Martha as well, he loved the family. This was his house, this was his consolation. Um, he's in a lot of interior turmoil and he's like, look, we're gonna stop there and this is his last stop of consolation before, before the hour of darkness, before the hour of betrayal, where he says like, I can't take this anymore, Father, please let this cup pass from me, it's too much. We always say it like if you know you have a loved one in your family who's destructive, like you imagine what's going on in the Lord's heart when he, he sees everybody as an individual and what they're doing and how they reject him. It's just too much. Lord, I can't take this. God, like, Father, pass this cup for me. So he's going to stop in Bethany where Lazarus was, the same one who had raised from the dead. And they gave him a dinner. Martha waited on them. And Lazarus was among those at the table. Mary brought in a pound of very costly ointment, pure nard, and with it anointed the feet of Jesus, wiping them with her hair. The house was filled with the scent of the ointment. So very expensive nard um, that Judas I think Judas here says he knew, I think he says the actual price, doesn't he? He says, Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the man who was to betray him said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? So Judas does know how much it was, 300 denarii. Um, you're, talk, you're talking about, it could be about 25,000 euro. Like, when it says it's a very costly ointment, you're talking about, like, really costly ointment. This is pure nard. And so you're talking, and the denarii was, the, it was a wage, the wage you would get for a day's work. So about a year's work, give or take, depends, but there's a lot of money. They say that, uh, Judas, he knew the price of everything and the value of nothing. You know, I mean, he knew how much it cost, but he, he actually wasn't seeing what was going on. Because our Lord said, you will always have the poor with you. Leave her alone. She's kept this for the day of my burial. You're not always going to have me with you. So it's a valuable moment, you know. You're not going to always be able to touch his feet and to anoint them and to have like physical contact with him, God, the God man. So this whole scene, you guys can get into it. This is in John's gospel. There are parallel gospels to Bethany, which is in Matt, Matthew, sorry, St. Matthew. Chapter 26, 6 through 12, Mark 14, 3 through 8. The parallel, so that's it's another episode in Bethany, but this is a good one because this is right on the right on the, the point of him going into Jerusalem. In the home of the mother. Hopefully at some point maybe we can make more references to the icon which we have hanging up. Um, it's basically a 
the condensed the con condensation of our spirituality all there in this icon. But a, a big part of our spirituality, which we, we were, we're very conscious of, is, is defending the Lord in His vulnerable presence in the Eucharist. Because He's like, it's like His form of, you know, and as a baby, He's like a baby again. Like, when He was a baby, He needed to be defended and protected by Joseph. Above all, by Joseph and then by Our Lady. Joseph's job was to be the custodian to protect the Lord's greatest treasures, our Blessed Mother and the Eucharist. You need to be reflected in St. Joseph if you're a man. You need to be reflected in, in the sense that you have to protect like the greatest treasures, your wife and your kids as well. You have to see them as, as treasures to be, to be taken into custody, that you're the custodian. So when we, you know, Bethany for us is also symbolic. It's, the we it was in is it the 29th of july the feast of saint martha and mary saint martha the feast yeah the 29th of july would be a special date for us as far as uh, the foundation of i don't because i always get that one mixed up with this is the foundation is our foundation of, Yes. Um, it's an important date for the home of the mother. Like, that was when we were founded on... Anyways, I want to start, like... The worst is that it's being recorded anyways, but look, whatever. But it's very important for us. It's a good date for us. And it's, I think it's providential that it's on the feast of St. Martha, which is also Mary and Lazarus, because... This idea of Bethany and of protecting him and taking him in before he's going to be dragged around and, and, and mocked and everything, the opposite of defended, he's going to be attacked. He goes there because he wants to find refuge. And it's this reality that I can be a consolation and I can be a refuge, I can be a protector of Almighty God. It's a, that's some mystery that he becomes so vulnerable that he needs to be defended. And he does, like he needs to be defended in every, yeah, you're, gonna, you're seeing it more and more that the Eucharist is just, uh, it's holy bread. In this country, it's, I think it's just been, it's been basically converted into holy bread. Where, I mean, sometimes I'm just like thinking, like when I'm at some of these masses where it could be a graduation mass or it could be like a funeral, like, you're just looking around and you're just trying to wonder what the difference is between you and the Church of Ireland. In the sense of, like, there's no faith in the Eucharist. Like, no faith in the Eucharist. In Spain, it's a bit different because, like, at the time, like, when people get up to go to communion, nobody gets up to go to communion because they all know the state they're living in. They can't receive communion. But here, it's like everybody gets up. They all receive the bread. Some of them say, thanks, Father, or, like, they even take it. And you're just sitting back there saying, like, if we don't really believe what this is, like, what, I mean, what's the difference here as far as their faith goes? Because the Protestants don't believe that it's the body and blood, soul and divinity of Christ. They don't believe in that. It's just like a symbol of communion. So, I mean, we need to be aware of this, you guys, because, like, you have, you actually have this massive privilege and responsibility to to bring him into a place where he's okay, which can be in your heart. And it's a heart that has faith. Because when the woman touched him in the crowd and she felt like strength come out into her body and heal her, and he looks around and he's asking who touched him, there was, there was literally hundreds of people pushing up on Jesus and touching him, as the disciples said. He's like, what do you mean who touched you? Like, you see all the people that are touching you. And he's like, he's looking, you, who touched me? And she confesses that it was her. And he says, how great is your faith? Because when she went to touch him, she knew exactly what was going to happen. I'm going to touch even the tassel of his cloak. Power is going to come out of him into me and I'm going to be healed of a disease that I've been 12 years trying to get taken care of and no one's known what to do. Humanly speaking, this is impossible. But he's more than human. He's the God man. And so if I have contact with him, I'm going to be healed. And I believe that. 
I believe that. Even though I see a man, my eyes of my faith are saying that there's something more there. And she touches him. So when you go to communion, you get in the communion line, hundreds of people are touching him. They're having contact with him. But he's looking for that one that's touching him with faith. Lord, I believe that you're truly here. I know who you are. You're, you're the son of man, you're God. In this humble presence of the Eucharist, and you touch him with faith. He reacts. And he goes into your heart, and he's okay. He has peace. He can, he can probably even fall asleep in your heart, like he did on the ship in the middle of the storm. Raging storm, things are going crazy, and he's, he's at rest. And he's okay in your heart. That's that's beautiful. That's beautiful that he can, that we can be that that defense, that we can be that refuge, that stronghold for for such a humble God. And that's what he's looking for because he does suffer, you guys. He still is suffering, and he needs he needs a Bethany. He needs a house where he can find someone who's going to say yes to him. Will you do this for me? I will not. You know, that's, you know how many times he's asking us to do something and we don't say it directly to him. We're not thinking I'm saying this to him, but I am saying it when I say no. I'm not doing that. I will not. Non serviam. I'm not going to serve. And so when he finds someone that says fiat, Yes, I will. Whatever you want me to do, let it happen. I'll do it. He can do things. And, I mean, he's, he's looking for that heart that's going to obey, that house of obedience that he can find where you're going to say yes. If it all started with, with a no, I'm not going to serve. And then the recreation, when, when he was able to do his plan and come down and become man, it all started with, yes, I will serve, of Our Lady, the obedience. Lord, help me to, to be more attentive and obedient to your voice so that you can also find this solace and this comfort in my heart. So that can be our meditation for going into tonight and for tomorrow. John chapter 12. Mary spent it all. She broke the jar of extremely expensive ointment. And that's a symbol of what can I give that has value to the Lord? Well, the most valuable thing you have is your life. But yeah, but I'm married with kids. It doesn't matter Give him, give, give him, give him until it hurts, break, and give him time, give him something maybe he's asking for, and the perfume filled the whole house. The fathers of the church have also seen that as an image of him breaking his body on the cross, and then the perfume of his spirit coming out into the world, and renewing the face of the earth, his Holy Spirit, the perfume of love. In complete, complete giving. Like he, if he broke himself for me and he poured out absolutely everything being God, if the nard was to about 25 grand, how much would a drop of his blood cost? Well, it's divine. And he, he, didn't, he didn't actually save a drop of it. It all was poured out. And he was thinking of my name when he was on the cross. He was thinking of me personally. How can I be so stingy and mean to be like holding back or giving him a bit? Like the rich guys would come into the temple and they would dump a whole load of money in there. But that was stuff that was just basically a little bit left over. And then this widow comes in and she throws in like three pennies. And it must have looked absolutely ridiculous. You're throwing in three pennies. You're not going to get anything with that. You could throw that away and no one would even notice. But she puts him in the money box, three little pennies. And he's back there sitting in the corner. He's watching her. And he's, he's moved. He's like, she just gave more than anybody else. Because she wasn't giving from what was abundant. She was actually giving when she was lacking. And she's giving more than anybody else here. Or she gave three pennies. Yeah, but she's a poor widow. She doesn't have anything. And she just put in the three pennies. And he's moved by the example. See, we have to, yeah, we have to give. 
And we have to, we have to examine our consciences if I'm, if I'm open to giving. Lord, do you find a, an open heart or a closed heart? As John Paul II would say, the worst prison is a closed heart. It's the worst prison. You're not, you're sterile and he can't do anything either. Lord, what are you asking of me? Please give me, give me the grace to say yes so that you can find in my heart an obedient heart. Obedience is also a heart that listens and that's attentive and that's willing to spend whatever it is if I'm spending it on God. So with this, we can have a time of prayer now. And like I said last night, go to sleep with this. The rest of the evening, kind of have this in your head, meditate the scene, go back into it. You can do the parallels as well. Put yourself in the house, observe what's going on. And then get spiritual benefit from it. But don't just meditate on ask, you know, at the, at the end for, Lord, give me the grace to be more attentive and defending you, um, to be more obedient and when it comes to listening to you, so that in my heart you can find rest, consolation, and solace.